Hello and welcome to uh, the Foundry Studio in the Department of Theatre, Film and Television Studies at Aberystwyth University. Um, some of us are joining in person in the room, and it's lovely to see people here. Um, and some people are joining via a Zoom call remotely. Um, so this is a, it's, it's going to be um, great to have this session. I'm just going to turn this on. So my name's Andrew. Um, I'm going to be the host for this evening, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Zoe Laughlin to the department for this session on material, adventures in materials and making. Um, for those of us who are joining here, with, because the university doesn't require us to wear masks, it is optional. We're encouraging people to do that, but we do have windows and doors open to allow some airflow. For those of you who are joining online, please stay muted up. Um, we've set it up as a call so that you can if you want to later on, ask questions verbally when we give you the opportunity and we'll be able to hear you in the room and you'll be able to hear us as well. If there are any problems with the quality of the, uh, the stream, please just pop a comment in the chat because we'll be keeping an eye on that as we go along. Um, and we are gonna be recording the talk, but we'll then stop the recording before we have time for discussion, more interaction at the end. Um, so very briefly, this is hosted, this event's hosted by the Centre for Material Thinking. And the Centre for Material Thinking was launched in November 2021 with uh, Carrie Noland coming. It's housed in TFTS and it seeks to stimulate interdisciplinary research into materials, uh, into uh, matter, and into making as well. Um, Dr. Kim Knowles and Dr. Miranda Wall, I think Miranda's online with us, um, they co-lead this the centre and it has contributions from staff in TFTS and across FAS and across the university as well. Um, we have a new website. Kim's very excited that the website is live for the Centre for Material Thinking uh, and we'll put that in the chat. Uh, it will need a few updates. Currently it's English only, but there will be a bilingual, there'll be a translation, it will be fully bilingual soon. So that's up and running and we'll, we'll spread that website URL around and things like the, the recording of today's talk uh, should be up there along with other events and things like that. Let's, uh, let me now introduce our special guest, uh, Zoe Laughlin. Um, Zoe is Zoe's a bit of a polymath, I think. She's a designer, a maker, a material scientist as well. Um, uh, she's currently, she is the co-founder and co-director of the Centre for uh, Making, the Institute for Making, sorry, um, and the Materials Library Project at UCL. She's probably very well known through her demonstrations of materials and stuff on television, uh, particularly ITV's This Morning program, which does demonstrations, but also through a range of appearances on uh, television and radio as well. Um, she's worked with a range of institutions, among them the v um, the Wellcome Trust, um, the Hayworth Gallery, the Tate Modern, and she's also a graduate of this department. Um, and before we did this, I looked up her record just to confirm that she is indeed... <laughs> oh, privacy. GDPR. I'm allowed to. It's pre-GDPR. It's pre-GDPR. Um, she is indeed a graduate of performance studies and film and television studies in the department, but then went on to do an MA at uh, Central St. Martin's and then a PhD at King's College in material science. Um, and she is also our most recent kind of honorary fellow nominated by this department, and she will be attending graduation in July, um, where she'll give a speech. And where I'll cry, that's what's going to happen. Gonna cry. I'm going to give a speech-ish. Te yeah, <laughs> through the tears. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's great that we can welcome her here. Because that all happened last year when there was lockdown and she couldn't come, it's fantastic to welcome you, Zoe, to the department um, as our newest honorary fellow and so amazing graduates. So um, welcome and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, right. Thanks for having me. First of all, water. One of them's stunt water, one of them's real water. So shout out if I drink the wrong one. Okay, so thanks very much for having me. It's a, I was on a quandary of what really to talk about until even now I don't know what I'm going to talk about, but I do a bit because part of the audience have seen me talk about things before. Many of you haven't. So there's a little bit of this I want to set the scene with. And there's a few old favourite things I want to talk about because they really are sort of fundamental to my way of thinking about things. But I also want to talk a little bit about some new adventures as well and um, hopefully some of you are coming to the workshop tomorrow because I think that's really where the proper 
stuff is going to happen. Um, if you're not, and there's still a chance to sign up, who knows? Um, it's going to be three hours long, so that might put you off. Um, <laughs> but it's paced, it'll be fun. And you need to bring with you an appliance. So what I mean by that is a domestic object that you plug in and then it does something like a hairdryer or a drill, you know, bring a, an appliance and something to make marks with pens and pencils is what I mean by that. Anyway, so that's just a little pitch for tomorrow's workshop. Um, and again, thanks to the department for having me. To begin with, just as a bit of context, the Institute of Making, oh, the slides aren't up, Never mind. Well, we'll just go with, that's the camera. There's a slide, there's a slide, yes. As Andrew mentioned, um, I started something called the Institute of Making about, oh gosh, 10 years ago, we called it the Institute of Making, but right, 15 years ago, the project started. But at the same time, it's, it's a life's work. And many of the things that are embedded in there were born here in Aberystwyth in my little head in the experiences I had here. So to set the scene of what this is right now, it's at one end, it, well, making for me is about materials and processes. And at the heart of the Institute of Making is our materials library, but this is an ongoing collection of stuff, basically, which lives on a number of different shelves, but this is one wall in the hangar. And this is one view in the hangar up from our mezzanine down. We've got a 10 ton crane and everything's reconfigurable and movable depending on what you want to happen. And then under where I'm standing taking this photo is a workshop space. But what I'm trying to get across is that it's one big void essentially. And it didn't exist before the Institute of Making exists. So I got a chance to like convert this space from, it was a loading bay full of skips and rats and like sodium lighting. And we built a mezzanine and built this space. But it was always in my mind, the Institute of Making was a stage. Like it was a stage for the performance of the materials. And this was a place where we were gonna celebrate stuff and we were going to allow process to happen and as an institution within a university, the model is if you're at UCL, you can become a member of the Institute of Making and you can come in and use the space. So you can get up to things in there and they can be anything that might be of interest to you. So someone might be like, I don't know, a PhD biomedical science student making some widgety woo woo heart valve thing, or someone might be like on the potter's wheels making a mess. That's all of that and everything in between is absolutely fine. There's no like, proper work you have to do there. We trust that you're just gonna get up to something and that the fact you want to is what we want to enable. And that then we provide this huge array of materials and tools that then enable a type of materials investigation. So you'll have architects and engineers and philosophers and linguists and designers and people in the space doing their work. But at the same time, if I zoom back, it's also another project, which is my belief that materials and processes are bigger than one discipline but that in themselves the materials are doing something and I want to celebrate that doing through building of a sort of an auditorium for them to do their thing and I'm currently uh, making a second space so we're going to be expanding it's due to open in 2023 and it's going to be 10 times bigger and we're not moving we're going to have like the mini one in the center of London and then this huge one on the Olympic Park next to the Anish Kapoor that's, the, that's what the sculpture looks like um, next to the Olympic Stadium. And so there's going to be a second one. And that's really like a cathedral in comparison in size. So that's like the palace of process and the cathedral of materials. And then this other one is like the black box theater of materials. But these are sort of the ideas that sit behind it. Like it's a, it's a stage. Um, I'm going to read this. It's, it's something I wrote maybe... It, 2008 I think during my PhD but it sums up a lot of things and I think it's going to provide us a structure to pick some stuff apart but I'm not a natural reader so bear with me if I balls up my own words um, materials perform stuff is constantly getting up to things matter is doing all of the time at varying scales of time and space in order to exist and generate the world of objects so this is kind of that foundational statement that summarizes lots of the things that are going to come up today that interest me and hopefully will make more sense at the end than it does now. So let's begin with the scale of space. 
because this is something within the paradigm of material science and engineering, which I kind of like have a foot in. It was kind of interesting coming from art college and performance studies and scenography into an engineering department because I was interested in how things were made and having not done like science A-levels and like the first year was like all undergraduate science stuff and I just had to do it. But I was interested and you do if you're interested in it. But what I realized is I knew things they didn't know because I'd done stuff with things, right? Like there was a, a slide moment where they brought up this cross section of a metal and it had a kind of funny granular pattern and they like, why is it like this? And I was oh, that's because it's been cooled too quickly and it's gone crackly around the edge. And like, I've used the wrong words. It would be the grains have gone, to, you know, there's a different language for it, but I knew what I was looking at. Whereas the engineering students didn't because they'd never cast anything from metal. But anyway, within material science, this is my vintage slide, um, which <laughs> is very important because this is the material science paradigm is about the relationship between structure and properties and that things have structures internally. And if you mess around with them, you alter their properties. So the properties of stuff and the structure it has are inextricably linked. And you discover this as you zoom into things, right? So you have the animate world, which is the living materials of us, you know, of carbon-based life forms and animals. We were talking flesh and tissue and hair and things. And culturally, it's not so much of an alien concept that, again, if you zoom in under a microscope, you might see like, oh, zoom into the mouse, then you might see a flea on the back of the mouse and zoom in another order of magnitude and there's hairs on the back of the flea. You go inside and then there's tissue and you go inside and then there's cells and you go inside the cells and then there's like ooh, things that I've forgotten the name of. And then you go inside those and then there's like DNA. But the point is that this is all packed down inside, but it talks to each other. Because again, we sort of understand, don't we, that DNA is a code to things like, oh, my DNA says, you all have brown eyes. And that's sort of written in every cell of my body as an instruction inside me for that kind of macro expression of the, my material. And equally, it goes both ways. And things have their codes at different levels. And you can rearrange things and genetically modify stuff to generate different properties in living material. But the same is true of inanimate matter. So wood and metal and glass and plastic and like the stuff that doesn't have a heartbeat but interestingly and not coincidentally I've used the same image here and here because when you get really really small there isn't any difference it's just an atom it's just a piece of carbon and then you might zoom up and go oh I see it might be called graphite and then you go a bit more and they go oh and it's a pencil and suddenly there's a name for the thing that was a material carrier but it's got a it's it's become human scale but the same is true. You might go, oh, it's carbon, and then it might be some onion tissue, and then, oh, okay, it's a, it's a human arm or something. Like things at certain levels kind of get names and other levels to other people have other names. But this sort of circling around the idea that scale is very important for materials, and this is the scale of space. But also the scale of time is really important. And this is something that within material science is less, it's not really what they're interested in because it's, in fact, they spend a lot of time trying to sort of deny form and deny time and sort of know, but within engineering time becomes a bit more important because it's like, is that bridge in 10 years gonna st still be standing or has we made it of something that slowly will be crumbling? No, those are sort of important things, but actually as an artist, Time is very important. And I look at things and appreciate how they are over time. You know, if a scenography is form in space over time, well, we've got the space, we'll come onto the forms, but time is embedded in these materials because what they are now is not what they're the same, what they were yesterday, and they won't be the same in 2000 years, and they weren't the same 2000 years before this. Like stuff is constantly in process. And in fact, making is a continual ongoing thing which we can kind of come on to. Well, in fact, let me just do it. Um, the, uh, just to get the cameras involved and the people at home having something different to look at. But um, I, I sort of always find myself slightly bristling at the notion of a raw material because it's such a, it's, it's only just one step away from talking of natural materials, which really makes me want to puke. But it's like, you know, it's, it's sort of a value judgment, right? It's like saying, 
natural materials good, non-natural materials bad. But I mean, asbestos is extremely natural and extremely bad. Like there's what bad to who, why, for what reason? Like it's so much more complicated than that. And it just is like, it becomes about marketing stuff, doesn't it? So I don't like to talk about materials in those terms. And raw, again, it's like, I know what you mean, but it's, it's entirely relative to where you're beginning your process of making and your process of, in, of material understanding. And that this is, a, this is a rock, which is a piece of malachite to a, to a geologist. They'll be like, oh yes, malachite. But this is the ore of copper. So if you want copper, which is a pure element on the periodic table, so in a way it's like it's fundamental matter. We're talking atoms that can't be split up into any other things with characteristics that that is copper atoms. To get copper, you have to make it. You have to process this stuff. So this is a raw material for the processing of copper, but this is a made thing as well. This has gone through a geological process of making. It's also gone through a process of mining and extraction and commodification. People have died getting this out of the ground. Like this is already a thing, like it's already a made thing, but it's then it's one person's raw material to then make some copper, but actually that's quite a sophisticated process of making. Are you getting these on the screen? You, ish, but not with color. Oh, well. Is it? Oh, well, that's fine. I'll hold it up a bit like this then. <laughs> um, you've got to do both. But then, so I made a, a furnace and um, this was a project I did at the Turner Contemporary Gallery in Margate where they were just like, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to smelt copper. Okay, how are you gonna, so then the project was, to extract copper from the ore in the gallery and built this furnace and extracted the copper. The point was to get it to the, the starting point that you might then make a sculpture from it, but stop at that point, if that makes sense. But um, so the, the copper is, you burn the copper with a large amount of carbon. So with coal, and then the carbon bonds with the oxygen in the copper ore. So this is a copper and oxygen mix and it rips that oxygen away, leaving you with just the copper at the bottom in a kind of slaggy thing. And then that gets processed and refined and turns into like copper powders and copper sheets and copper sticks and copper ingots. Copper that if you were going to make some bronze, you'd order an amount of and melt it down to make bronze with tin, or you'd take that copper and use it to make pipes or like it becomes a new raw material after that point. Anyway, so scale of time. The point I really coming back to is that the copper that we know as a thing, we go, oh, that's a piece of copper, that pipe or here's a copper spoon, right? These things aren't fixed either. Like you, I've purposely not cleaned that and you will see how it changes because I've touched it and that it's slowly reacting with the um, water and oxygen and transforming. And ultimately given the right conditions and enough time, it will go back to being this, like this is where it would prefer to be. So it's just a continual journey of process of the stuff and for a moment, we give it a shape we'll call spoon, but we'll come on to shapes of things in a bit, maybe. Um, so then again, within a kind of arts practice, you can look at materials with different equipment to give you a perception of their temporal behaviors. And um, this is a small time lapse I made, just a 20 second resultant video, but what it was was five hours worth of it just sat there on a desk and when you go in and look at it, it wasn't doing anything. And I leave the room again and I come back and it's still not doing anything in front of my eyes. But the point is it's doing something all of the time in the same way as the floor is doing something all of the time to mean that I don't just like fall through it, you know, and it doesn't go crack. Like back to the same, materials are doing things all of the time. We just don't necessarily think about it. And this is a way you can use different techniques over the time lapse of starting to see what it's up to. Um, so this is Silly Putty, children's toy. Do you have Silly Putty? Brilliant. I'll, sh I'll give your dad a recipe. But um, it's a non-Newtonian fluid, so it behaves in a non-standard liquid way, in that when you hit it, it becomes more solid. Um, but it flows over time. Um, and then this is a the same sort of notion of exploring time of materials, but taken it the other way. So I'm now using a high-speed camera to uh, capture two thousandths of a second worth of material performance. And this, I made a rig to break wine glasses with sound. And this was a performance I did at Tate that was part of a 
project I did about the sound and materials, but the crescendo of the show was this moment where everybody had to have head, ear defenders on and it was, it was, it was in very intense, continual breaking of many different glasses. Um, but the point is really, is that when you now look at it at a high speed camera, you see glass behaving in a way you don't see glass behaving normally. Who knows if this is even visible in the room with the lights up, but can you see the top is wanging in and out like this, right? And it's not broken. That glass is moving because glass actually has elasticity to it. Like, you know, it, like an elastic band is elastic, but you don't see it because normally you can so easily push glass beyond its elastic limit that it breaks, that you're so used to just glass breaking, you never get a chance to see the point before it breaks. So you can, in fact, if you know a glass worker, glass blower of any, don't even need to be particularly skillful for this, but you can make a glass spring and it will bounce. So, but very easily it breaks. So there's this point where glass does this and looking at it with taking a small amount of time and stretching it out, you start to see that behavior and that experience of glassness. Um, but then to generate the world of objects, well, then we have a problem again, because like, what is an object? But also what is a material? And I start to think back to it always being in process. It's relevant. It's just sort of dependent upon who you ask and what they're dealing with. Like one person's material is another person's thing. I, it's not really a well-defined thing. If you're a chemist, it's the stuff on the periodic table. If you're an engineer, it's the stuff in the engineering handbook that you have equations about. Like it's, it's actually a much more fluid definition. And I think there's, I sort of believe there's this sort of idea of a material and there's also this idea of an object. And when you get stuff in the world, it's just a negotiation between the material and the form that it wants to be, that maybe we've put it in or it just is, you know? And there's this, this constant negotiation between material and object. And so I would write material hyphen object. I should have written that, I didn't. But, but the moment we've got objecting, because I want to talk a little bit about the tyranny of the swatch. So in building the, building the materials library and operating in a kind of materials world where people go, oh, you're interested in materials. I'm, I come up against these sorts of objects, swatches, so not the watches, but samples of stuff, right? So this is a paint chart swatch and it's a type of way in which you can have an experience of something to do with the color, which is, that big, you know, it's not the paint, it's a swatch. Similarly, material suppliers sort of send swatches to things. And you could, I mean, I don't recommend it, but you might find yourself at some sort of trade show. And the people will be sort of saying, oh, we've got this amazing new aluminium. In fact, this happened to me once. They're like, this is the shiniest aluminium in the world. And you're like, brilliant, let me have a look. Yeah, it's really shiny. But the thing is, it's, it's the size of a credit card. And Therefore, it's, I then did another project where um, I had a chance to make some work to go into the tape for a special sort of, the idea was, you know, normally it's please do not touch, right? I said I wanted to do something that was all please do touch. But I then made a perverted swatch of, all, instead of changing the material, I just changed the size and had all of the A sizes like you'd have in an art supply shop of this shiniest aluminium in the world. And the minute you have a bit this big, you realize it's wobbling around because it might be very shiny, but it's not very stiff. And it, suddenly it's not as shiny because it's all sort of bendy. And like you realize shininess, ultimate shininess is there, but you change the vector of the size of it and it's not so shiny anymore. So you've got this constant negotiation of properties. Anyway, tangential, but swatches, they're kind of sexy as well, which is annoying because they're kind of like, oh yeah, alluring, all the nice things. And you sort of want them. You sort of want them because you sort of feel like, oh yes, lovely, I'll have those. But then you're like ultimately very unsatisfied. It's like a very good looking person who's really, really dull or something. It's like, this is, this is an object which instantly I'm frustrated with and instantly it's not delivering for me because it's not telling me what, what it's like or it's sort of giving me a sense of one dimension of it, which is what it's like to have a bit like this, that thick on a chain. You know, it's not telling you really what it could be like. So I started to try and make other things. Um, I, 
made a work which was about density. And this came from a project where I said to, I proposed, what I wanted to do was change the labels in the gallery. So this was the Tate. I also tried it with another gallery. They said no. So I've got two no's on this. But the proposition was change the labels next to the sculptures. So it wasn't just, um, I don't know, well, the original one was a Fontana Italian sculptor, the, a big ball of bronze that he started as a ball of clay. He slashed it, it got cast in bronze. The bronze sphere with a slash in it sits on the floor in the gallery. So I'm like looking at the labels, Fontana, 1976, bronze, like one meter by 90 centimeters by 80 centimeters, something like imagining it's in a box. But I just wanted to add like 300 kilograms or 15 kilograms. Like the proposition is let's weigh it and put that on the label. That's the work is the new information on these labels. And that I wanted to weigh the tape was really the idea. And that I could do it with equipment. We could do it through equations. Like there's lots of different ways you could extrapolate the mass of these objects. But what I realized was that it was actually too much of a sort of challenge to the agreed curatorial statements about stuff. Like they weren't, because also if I did it for that one, we'd have to do it for the other ones. And we hadn't had the conference about that yet. And we haven't had the conversation about that. And maybe, maybe no, but it'd be interesting to make something else that addressed the weight of it. Anyway, inside information, I was able to give a little swift kick and that sculpture is actually hollow. It gives a little donging sound. So it's actually not as heavy as it could have been if it was like solid bronze. So maybe they also didn't want to reveal that it didn't have that kind of poof that it could have had. Anyway, so next to that, instead of weighing it, I made, um, like 50 cubes of different materials, all four centimeters by four centimeters by four centimeters in as many different materials as possible. And the idea was they'll be there. You can't touch that, but you can touch this. And it would be like an essential experience of mass, essentially. You'll have a thing, like I spent a lot thinking, what, how big should it be? It's gotta be big enough that you feel the weight of it, but not so big that a, a child couldn't pick it up, but satisfying enough to stand, sit in an adult's hand, like. What, and then what well, should they be cubes? And um, I'd done work, in fact, in Avarisworth around cubes. And so there was a long reason why I wanted it to be cubes, but there was also a reason that the cube is materially informative. Okay, so we'll come on to that, but hold that thought in mind. And we'll do touching later, maybe, yes. Or do you want touching now? No, I'm, I'm, I'm onto the joy of sets because the thing is what I realized once I'd made these cubes that I bloody well made a swatch. And I was like, oh God, damn it. I can't believe it. I've made a swatch. And what do I do with this swatch? Should I put them all on some ludicrous chain and really like make something really perverse? And, or do I just have to acknowledge in myself that there is a joy in the set? But actually what I'm doing is trying to take what the swatch is doing, but give you more, right? So then started to make sets because for a long time I couldn't really make things anymore because I just sort of thought I can't do better than that or that I'll just have that that's enough and then I started to think well maybe I could make something with it that wasn't too much of an imposition on it but said some enabled it to say more than it did when it just was a blob of something but could I make a thing so started making things that as objects brought something else to the table but played with this notion of a set so there's a methodology of keeping the form the same, changing the material, then the change in performance of the thing is directly attributable to the material. So a set of tuning forks where the sound they make, because they're all the same size, if it were the same material would sound the same, but they sound different because of those materials. Uh, made sets of spoons, made bells, made bugles. Um, uh, Mike Pearson taught me, always have an idea in your back pocket. And this is a good example of that because I always thought, well, I'd love to make a glass symbol. And the idea of the glass symbol is that it would be one day there would be a performance and it would be in the Royal Festival Hall and the score, I wanted to have a score where the symbol would have two sounds. One is the sound of it being hit. The other is the sound of it being broken. And that that would be kind of like another one in this set because I've made the brass symbol, I've got a bronze symbol I've copied it off, I can make other symbols of other materials, but the glass symbol would then have a performance attached to it. Anyway, with an idea in the back pocket, 
someone was asking me about this the other day in an interview and then I said oh yeah I've got an idea in my back pocket about this and I'm like, well we're actually speaking to a composer in America next week for the same program maybe the journey of this tv program is we put you two together and we're making the glass symbol and there's going to be a performance in Boston with the glass symbol so you never know what can come up of stuff um but again a sort of foundational principle important thought is that within materials every contact leaves a trace so I'm putting this in quotes because this isn't my words this is the basically the catchphrase of forensic scientists that go around you know hunting for remnants of things <laughs> and if something's touched something else they should be able to prove it is their point and you know we see this all the time with materials um but i really felt it i had a um a part-time job when i was doing my masters in a sort of fancy furniture store that also sold homewares do you know what i mean and um you, you, know, you polish the glasses and arrange them all and like within moments somebody touches the glasses that you've like been tight. It was like, it's so infuriating that like people would come in and like ruin the nice display that you just had to like, and then you've got to like, they go out and you've got to go and polish the glasses and put everything back and like make it look nice again. And so there was like, so it was, I was so aware at how annoying touch could be, but at the same time, everything I was doing was saying, you have to touch it. So I had to embed a methodology later in my you know this was at one stage but I never lost that memory of how annoying it was watching people touch this stuff and then later within my art practice realizing I'm absolutely teeing up opportunities time and time again for people to ruin things through touch and that's actually what I would like them to do that it was an interesting moment um, to acknowledge that but then within the set of cubes there's I mean well that's you can't see that at all is it even up there that's almost poetic because we are dealing with the material that you can barely see but anyway um, oh. <laughs> um this is a material made by the jet propulsion laboratory at nasa and they catch stardust with it but the reason i want to mention it is that it's the most trace capturing matter i've ever come across the minute you touch it your oils and sweats and skins will stick to the surface and it's the lightest solid in the world, uh, but the, I've got a few pieces, some that I've never touched and some that people have touched. And the pe ones that people have touched are twice the weight of the ones people have never touched. So that tells you both how light the stuff is, but also how gross people are when they touch things. Isn't that brilliant? And, and then you're into like COVID and it's like this glorious sensibility to the touching of things. And I'm like, both repulsed but also I'm like licking it like what am I doing why have I just but I need to know it so I put it in my mouth and then I'm like I've just put that in my mouth what's wrong with me so it's always this sort of interesting but the foundational principle within the materials library is that you can touch everything and also things don't have a place so there's none of that put that back where you got it from business because actually it's very interesting to put these two things together that haven't sat next to each other for a bit and rearrange it and think hmm there's an interesting thing about gray, gray stuff. Let's put some gray stuff. Like, there's, there's, there's a constantly evolving taxonomy that isn't fixed. It is a conversation with the things and the thing that might be happening with the things. And but yeah, it has some sort of seed back in this moment of acknowledging that you discover something through touch, but also appreciating some things are problematic. Anyway, because the reason, again, we want things to be touched is that damage is a revealer of materiality. So this is kind of my central principle when like some sort of museum person comes around and they say, well, we can't have someone touch it or why haven't you got preservation stuff on this work? Because it's, it's like we, the, the damage is what is material telling you what it's like. OK, so back to the wine glass breaking. One made of wood wouldn't break like that. The way something breaks tells you what it's like the way something becomes damaged tells you what it's like so back to that um, and then I started making sets that were purposely designed to be broken and I did a show called will it break but it was like a face-off of hammer versus thing and was the hammer going to break or was the thing going to break 
So a whole, this is just some of the hammers, but, um, and actually I was breaking wine glasses again, because it's, it's a good sort of object that people can maybe have broken themselves and you know the sort of level of force it might take. But yeah, concrete hammer, the stone hammer, the plastic hammer, the foam hammer, the sugar hammer was surprisingly good. Like there's different hammers and it's like, what's gonna, and then, yeah, so it's very simple, but you, what's gonna break in this negotiation between the hammer and the, this thing I was smashing with the hammer? Um, I'll just some close up pictures of that. But um, by this point, the cubes were back in my um, workshop, office, lab, studio type space. And we're sitting on the shelves, the kind of thing that had happened, interesting, pick them up, blah, 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 blah. And then one day I came in and I found this cube like this. So this is the white chocolate cube. And this is um, a white chocolate cube enjoy, enjoyed by who knows how many mice, hopefully mice, not rat. Like this is, this was in that moment, I was like, oh my God, we've got mice. There's a mouse, is, this is awful. And, oh, but also like, this is bloody brilliant. These mice, they know their shit. First off, I had like 10 different chocolate cubes there was a hundred percent, there was a 95%, a 90%, an 80%, a 72, a 70, a 60, a milky bar, a, you know what I mean? A caramac one, like there was all chocolate life was there. The mouse only ate the white chocolate one. There's no messing about, highest calorie content, highest fat content, boom, straight in there. Don't want to mess about, needs to survive this mouse. But also it's done a material form cube analysis. Or, okay, so this is back to why did I pick cubes is because over time, cubes become spheres. And that's because the cube, it, mechanically, there are weak points of this form and they are, the weakest point is the corner, and the second weakest point is an edge and then it's faces. So if you want a better description, if I was to lob it across the floor, the bit most likely to chip off would be a corner. Um, unless it came into contact with something harder and then it might dent it, but do you know what I mean? So the corner is the weakest spot. So the mouse, it knew this, it's no fool. It, you think to yourself, you're going to eat a giant cube. You don't just face plant the flat bits, do you? You get, you get yourself on the edge and then even better, get yourself on the corner and start to nibble. And you slowly, you nibble it into, it's, it's nibbling it into a sphere and it's doing this perfect demonstration of, this transformation of that form will become that form given enough time and the right kind of conditions. Um, but this holds for all of the cubes. So for the, in the show, the blue tack cube became a blue tack ball because it's just impossible for, you know, a thousand people over the course of a day who touch a thing for it not to become a sphere. Um, but anyway, the mouse knew that damage is a revealer of materiality and the cube would become a sphere. Um, but materials, again, these are all little sort of sayings and phrases I've developed over the years that sum things up, but materials for the advancement of conceptualization is really what I describe as the effect that happens when you experience materials. It changes your ability to think about things and imagine stuff because now you've got a new model in your head that's not just in your head, it's in your hand and your body because you've experienced it. And so um, at that point, let's see what's next. Getting up to things, we'll save that for the end. Now, how are we doing on time? Good, good, good. Now we're gonna have some th more things. So um, volunteer, volunteer, do you want to volunteer? No, it's too much. Daddy, yeah. Well, okay, everyone can get a go at this, but I need someone to do it first. So you get to see it. Don't block the view, please. No Okay, what I want you to do is lift this one up in this sort of pinchy grip, mm -hmm. then lift that one up. So that one, then that one. Okay, Simon, do it the other way around and we'll work out what's better. So that one first, yeah. So I think that way round was better. Yeah. Looked better. You okay? So the rest of you now know something about this, don't you? I give you some more information. Okay, so you know that this one's the heavy one, this one's the light one, but it, you need to feel it. 
to, to really know that. And I would say then, judging on Simon, let's go this one first, then that one, because you have an immediate muscle memory. You have an immediate comparison. Everything's the same in terms of the dimension of the thing. So the gesture is exactly the same, but it's like completely different. Um, should we have that one as something people can come up for the end? Because I think I could pass it around, but then you know it before you pick it up. So anyway, um, whilst I'm on a cube, let's talk a bit about this one. Um, excuses to make things come along, don't they? Like the idea in the back pocket, or you get asked to do thing, or you propose a thing, or whatever. But um, don't underestimate the power of like being really annoyed about something to really motivate you into like doing something. And also the power of like sort of wanting to show off and impress someone who you sort of fancy. That is also very powerful. And the two things come together here. Um, I was, someone said to me, oh Zoe, have you come across transparent concrete? I was like, oh no, it sounds kind of great. What's that? I was look it up. And I was like, oh, it's not transparent concrete. It's concrete with some glass in it. And it's the glass that's transparent. Oh, okay. And then someone else mentioned, oh, you must get a bit of this transparent concrete. Like, what's going on with the transparent concrete? So I write to the suppliers and I'd love a bit of your transparent concrete for our materials library. No. Okay. I'm happy to pay for a sample. You know, no, you don't supply samples. So I only wanted to deal with like prestigious architects or no one. I was like, there's something so arrogant about the way they replied and how shit the thing really was. Like it wasn't, I was like, it doesn't warrant that level of kind of, secrecy or some protectiveness about it like it was just really infuriating like it was a concrete panel and it had um pieces of optical fiber so little rods of glass scattered in it so that if you shone a light the other side of the wall you'd have like a starry randomly patterny effect uh, they've progressed it a little bit more but i thought at this point they've sort of missed a trick so i'm gonna bloody well make my own because it was so annoying. So the, this is the first bit I made. And the trick I thought was try and lay those optical fibers with resolution. So put fiber A1 on one side in position, the same position on the other side. So, so this is the cube. Can you see, is that, is that shining through there for those at home? Hello, posterity. Um, where are they? I'm trying to get the angle. Okay, and then if I move my finger through it, you see it's, it's got resolution because they're arranged as a grid, sort of simple, but actually it's an analog screen. So you can embed this in any structure. And the point is here it goes in a straight line, but here it kind of goes around a corner. So it goes in here and out that side. So the optical fibers are lying inside. And actually there's like a system to make this. But anyway, I made this one to sort of proof of concept. I've given that away, terrible storytelling. Um, but then I got asked to give a talk at REBA, which is like the Royal Institute of British Architects. And I have a small pet theory that there's something quite sexy about architects because they've got like the kind of creativity side, but they're not as mad as the art students or the, and they're not as sort of autistic as the engineers. Like this is a lovely sweet spot in my imagination. Um, <laughs> So I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna go and speak to like 250 architects and I'm bound to get someone come up to me and this would be brilliant, I really impressed them. So then I thought, well, I'm gonna make one that goes around a corner. Uh, I did a, one on my parents' farm and like proof of concept scaling it up and stuff. Didn't get a single phone number, but I did get like brilliant material samples and things that give me ideas to then make other things and like demonstrate what stuff can get up to. Um, while we're on the optics, Thing. another nice fun bit for the people at home do i need to give that extra lighting maybe let's see so we've got shall i say a raw material just to annoy myself this is a, a piece of rock dug out the ground as it would be found but then the surface is polished so this is a rock that's just had its front and back face buffed up um and when it gets polished hang on i need to tip this on a slight angle it becomes slightly transparent so you can, but you can't actually see through it. What happens is it brings one thing, hang on, which thing? Oh, it doesn't like that. Can you see what's happening is it sort of brings it to the surface of the rock if you look at it straight on. So you're not looking through it. It's actually acting as a natural optical fiber. So 
as optical fibers, these are very thin bits of glass where light that goes in one end comes out the other, but without any loss of quality. And that could like go around the world and pop out the other end and you send that light beam down and you don't lose that quality. But the light travels through this in exactly the same way. So then I had to go at fusing optical fibers together to make a rock thinking it might be brilliant and it bloody is. So look at this bit. So this is now a few, I'll show it first just as it is. So there is a fused piece of optical fiber becoming a solid chunk, but it's really the clarity, oh no. I do do telly, honestly. Um, the clarity that this one is, is like second to none. Can you see that? Is that sort of showing up? It, it brings it to the top much better than the, the naturally occurring rock one. Maybe I'll just find something a bit more, any old thing. Can you see that? Anyway, I'll pass that round so you can have a little look at some, put it on the screen of your phone, say, and see it come through. But it's an entirely analog screen in some respects, but it has this materi materiality to it that becomes, so we assume is so digital because we're used to this notion of the screen being digital, but it's just light passing through a material in a very unusual way. Anyway, that was an optics moment. What else have we got? Um, let me turn my little torch off before I use all the battery. In fact, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Ooh, I don't know where to go next. Someone point to a thing, maybe. How are we doing on time? I should have checked that. Oh, we're good. We're good, we're good. Okay, okay. Um, well, while we're on concrete, this is a, this is a good one. This is, um, this is a piece of self-healing concrete. So this is a, a concrete that's straddling that animate and inanimate uh, boundary that I showed you before, you know, with animate materials on one side, inanimate on another. There's now a whole world of materials that are sort of trying to be somewhere in between and do things that kind of incorporate the best of both worlds or interesting things from each world. Um, and this piece of concrete has bacteria impregnated into it. So they're part of the structure, but they're also dead in essence, they're just entirely dormant and would stay dormant for thousands of years. They were discovered um, on the rim of volcanoes and they just sort of live in the ashes until it's no longer a volcano and then it's a hillside with rain and stuff and then they get to work. So they're ready to just sit there. Um, and they're sitting there in that, but if they get wet, they wake up and they look around and there's a starch in there that they like to eat and then those bacteria get to work eating it and then they get to work excreting out stuff and that stuff, so bacteria poo, heals cracks in this concrete. So this is a concrete which, okay, I can't snap it, and dip it in some water and it poo itself back together. This is about the scale of cracks that occur when things naturally, there's two ways cracks can occur, right? One is a catastrophic failure, wrecking ball, earthquake, boom, boom, boom. The other is the slow stresses and strains and creeping over time of things kind of just like oh, straining a, 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 the pressure of existence. And those stress cracks, moisture gets in, bacteria wake up, poo, 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 poo it back. So it's constantly, it's a live reactive material that is constantly fixing itself. And I think repair is something that the Institute of Making is again central to what sort of interests us because it's a type of making practice and it's a type of practice that acknowledges objects in an interesting way that it says that people say that's now broken but it's it's just not doing the thing we thought it would do anyway that the self-healing materials are kind of in the future of all of us but we are self-healing right we can repair ourselves um but yeah repair is is really interesting Maybe tomorrow I will wear my repaired jumper. I was packed for it was going to be cold and it's not. So I'm not wearing my woolly jumper to show you that. But yeah, acts of repair and how you fix things and how you can do an intervention on an object is kind of interesting. Um, next along the line, um, let's, when we've gone on to repair, maybe we should talk about another annoying word. Yes. So... Um, we'll go into some plastic realms. In fact, let's go to it via this because I think I like the look of that one into that one. So first off, 
No, first off, this one. So this, this is tile of the blackest black. The blackest black. So this is like that transparent concrete, the, what I describe as the superlative material, the material that's got like a newspaper article about it because it's somehow really brilliant. And it does, the, it's the most thing of the most of it. So the shiniest aluminium, you know what I mean? The blackest black thing, the strongest strong thing. The, but the irony of these things is that they may be, they're very, very, very good at one thing. And sometimes only really that one thing, but also they're very, very good at that one thing, but quite soon someone else is gonna invent one that's a tiny bit more of it. So it's not. So the, the aerogel from NASA for a good 10 years was the lightest solid in the world. But then someone did one that was like 0.001% lighter than it. And so like, oh, sort of not as good anymore, is it? Because it's not the lightest one. <laughs> sort of killed it. But actually the new lightest one was very light, but only existed for like three seconds. So, oh, well, maybe then there's a trade-off back to like, this is the lightest solid in the world that you can also hold. Maybe it comes back up to play, but no one wants that kind of caveat when they're in the world of superlative materials. So anyway, we all know the race for the blackest black and then Anish Kapoor buying the rights to Vanta Black and then some, but someone else makes one. Like, you know, there's been a kind of, it's like the arms race for blackness and the, people want this pigment and it has a very much a commercial value to it. So this is why people care enough. There is also a pinkest pink, but there's not the same commercial bias to like beat that. So it's just a lovely project, the pinkest pink. But the blackest black, Painting things black is really important for certain technical applications and to make something absorb all visible light is the goal. Anyway, NASA said, you can have a bit of this blackest black we've made. Brilliant, lovely, thanks very much, NASA. But they said, but first, it's just doing a bit of a tour around somewhere. It's, on, it's in an exhibition, I don't know, in Milan or something. So when it's finished being on the show there, we'll send it to you. So then I got it and I was like, it's bloody grey. I mean, it's not, it's just like the most, um, it's, just, it's not even showing on the camera. Oh, can you see that sheen? Because guess what? People have touched it, which is fine. So I have to accept that. It's great. But the point is, it was very, very black, but very, very, very unstable. It's extremely cr crumbly. And just in the moving of it around, it all crumbled off. So it's not even there anymore. Anyway, but something else that is black is this which is a nice bit of a sort of turd of a material. Um, this, is, this is a vinyl record. So again, thinking about what is an object, we know the word, we know what comes to mind when I say the vinyl record, but this is also the vinyl record, but this is the millisecond before it's stamped with the information of a vinyl record. So materially, the vinyl record, this is in the factory, it's like, <laughs> turd, 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 stamp. So they're going along like this, they get stamped and then they're records. But this is like the moment before the birth of the record is what this nice lump is. Catch, nice. I'll also pass around the blackest black because you can't do anything wrong with that. But, but not black anymore. Have a little look at that. <laughs> um, whilst we're on turds, this is, this is a poo my dad polished for me because um, we, yeah, we were looking at coprolites, which are fossilized dinosaur feces, and um, you can polish the turd, but that's a, that's a nice object to look at later. Um, so in other industrial processing worlds, there's a kind of, again, the, another word that gets aligned with material discussions quite a bit is sustainability, and I can understand that, and it's very important. But it's also worth saying, really, there is no such thing as sustainable materials. Um, you just have to let that one go because what there really is, is there's only sustainable processes. So the material is just the material and the degree to which it's sustainable is entirely derived from how we interact with it and what we do with it and how we marshal it or enforce something upon it or treasure it or what have you. Yeah, you can't, there aren't sustainable materials, but it's, it, it is interesting once you start to look at waste and how we both make things and we break things and how we deal with things that we no longer want anymore. 
and when we're ready for them to like just be not in our lives anymore what happens to all those amazing things that have been like someone's life's work like this biro like it's 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 incredible like you've got polystyrene high density polyethylene ink stainless well actually bra, uh, bronze and then stainless steel ball like this wouldn't work without stainless steel because you need the right hardness for the ball to not be worn away or be mushed into the other metal in order for it to rotate in the little socket for the ball, the ink to flow around. And this is an extraordinarily sophisticated object, but it's in some respects entirely disposable in that I don't replace the ink and I'll probably it gets thrown away before it's even used up. Like it's not something that's designed to be kept for life. Um, and, and let's be fair about this, like keeping everything you ever own, that becomes like a mental illness, doesn't it? Like you see a documentary about someone who dies under their own rubbish because they can't throw anything away. Like being able to throw things away and part from materials is actually necessary to get on with other things, I suppose. So I'm, I'm acknowledging that because it is really complicated and there's no simple answer to that. But when you're in the world of materials and making things, it's sort of not, it's impossible not to discuss and think about the end of life of stuff and that it's potentially the beginning of a new life for something else. Um, this is a piece of plastic high density polyethylene that's used to make milk bottles. And they are white bottles that you'll get in the supermarket, right, with little colored lids on top. And um, in this country, the color of the lid it takes it was an indicator sorry for what's inside the bottle so that this means semi-skimmed blue whole red skimmed yeah what's that one called the water one i can't remember um but uh, but the thing is these are highly recyclable objects and often those white containers are they've been milk bottles a number of times and i don't just mean like washed out like they used to be when they were glass I mean, they've been melted down and made into new milk bottles. And companies, when they take your recycling, will sort that out to get the high value material, which is essentially the white, because once you start melting down plastics, actually, even if you clump all blues together, they're always gonna be just like mm, sludge blue. They're never gonna be like ping, azure or something. They're like, they're, they're very particular mixtures of things and you're never gonna get that particular color again. And so white is the premium grade recycling material because you could one you could dye it any other color and two people will keep buying it mostly in that kind of system of recycling anyway the company who like they shred up these bottles and they melt it all down the problem they get is that the white often comes out kind of weird bogey greeny gray because the most common lid is the green one and so if ever a little bit of the colored plastic gets in with the white plastic it's most often a bit of green plastic and kind of contaminates it and then they have to purge it and what have you but um whoo, that's a bit of the, the 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 contaminated white plastic but the company went to the they got all the supermarkets around the table and said can you just put white lids on the milk no, no. <laughs> the british people need their colored lids so but they what they managed to get them to do was change the amount of pigmentation so the the lids used to be fully opaque like that There's enough pigment in to be quite a strong color they managed to get them to reduce the pigment level i'll hold that up for the room so you can see one's not black one is green so they're two green lids this is pre-pigment reduction post-pigment reduction so essentially if a bit of that green gets in it's not quite as bad but still it's like you suddenly realize why don't they have white lids? This is madness. You could have a color sticker on it, it would burn off. Like, it's a huge system we're up against. And we are dumb, stupid animals who get allured by a sexy swatch. You know, you go to a supermarket and you'll buy some shampoo or something. Or, I mean, shampoo could even be, it's like shower gel, right? So let's take shower gel because I think that's even more of a perfect example of this. You could have, the same stuff in all those bottles, the only thing the manufacturer have got to make you pick one or the other is really the packaging because it's packaging and the scent that they put in it. If you look at the ingredients list, it's the same stuff, but this one smells different. But this one's in a black bottle, so it must be for men. 
It's like, it's like the, they don't advertise this stuff on telly because it's too cheap to make you want it properly. So the only moment they've got is when you're at the shelf and you sort of do that. And therefore the bottle was a very powerful object for them and their ability to manipulate it and dye it different colors and make it stand out from the others is like all they've got. That's all they've got. Whereas actually the most sensible thing would be to say, it has to be a white bottle. That's it. If it's single use plastic object, it's a white bottle. Bob's your uncle. They can all be recycled. And we've got lovely white plastic. We've got, uh, we're good to go. But as I said, they won't do that because, yeah. in fact, they've been asked to do it. And what they say is, well, we put one in a white bottle and people didn't buy it. It was because we're idiots and we, we like the one that looks jazzy. Do you know what I mean? Of course, we're not going to buy it. But then you realize oh, it has to be legislation and you've got to do it at European level at least. And you've got to make it the rule that if you're doing a single use plastic, it's got to be white, let's say. Or you just pick whatever color, but you know, it's got to be a single color. But yeah, because it's actually quite a good material in lots of ways. It's lightweight. That plastic bottle is only squeezy because of the flexibility of the plastic. Anyway, that's a sort of hobby horse, but I think it's within the materials conversation, it's important to acknowledge that complexity and the, we, it's difficult. We can't individually take responsibility for actually a system on that scale. It's really difficult. Unfortunately, I think this, the answer will be something like Amazon just like own milk and then all contain, do you know what I mean? They Like really it has to be done at a scale that you just, you buy into being, let's say a waitress person or a Tesco's person or whatever it is, and your delivery comes and you use the stuff and then they pick up the containers as well and then they refill them. And that will probably be what happens. Anyway, dull. Oh, let's get on to something more exciting. Chocolate, yes. Right, so this is chocolate, but it's not really chocolate as we know it in that um, it's, let's do a test. Okay, where shall I start this? I've segued now and I don't know my beginning point to bring it in. Okay, so chocolate is a highly engineered material, right? It is designed to make you go mm -hmm, and have another bit. That's, it's, it's, it is delicious because they've worked out how to make it absolutely irresistible and delicious. It's the perfect combination of fats and sugars in the way that it just makes you unable to not put another bit in your mouth. But it's also engineered because you have to, it's a perfect, it's a, it's a mixture of ingredients that make something that's stable in quite a small window of environmental conditions. And this is really apparent if you think of like, I don't know, something like dairy milk, which is kind of sold the world over, but it's not the same everywhere you go. And you, some of you may have been to a country and sort of thought, this chocolate's awful. And like you, the outback on Australia and a, you know, little shop buy a bar of chocolate. It's not the same chocolate as you would buy in a shop in Aberystwyth because the environmental conditions in which that chocolate has to live, not the same. So they engineer it differently to mean that it won't melt in the shop because what happens is when something, this is, so we'll go back to what it is. So it's fats, sugars, and um, cocoa solids, cocoa butters, and sugar. And when you've got liquid chocolate, it's one thing when it solidifies what's happening is the sugars are crystallizing the fat globules are sort of being distributed evenly through that and it's forming this kind of matrix that is of a certain all of those bits have sort of formed at a certain size and it's tempered to create a certain material composition down inside the material at a certain scale and that at that when they get it right it means that if it sits on the table it's not melting if i put it in my mouth so i just raise the temperature by like 10 degrees suddenly mm, melty but in Australia, it has that temperature in my mouth might be the temperature in the room. So they then engineer it so that when it put it in your mouth, it's not really doing it melty. It's more like a bit dry and a bit crunchy because it's not doing that. Oh, I have an Australian. You can vouch for it. <laughs> anyway, what I've got here is chocolate that I've purposefully attempted to make non-melty. So my hope is we can pass this round and it doesn't leave chocolatey marks on people's hands. We shall see. I mean, don't like grip it for dear life, but by the time you have a quick look at it and pass it on, 
hopefully we're not like leaving a sticky chocolate trail, but this is a live test, who knows? I might have balls it up. But this is, this is chocolate, which has um, bloomed. So it's quite nice if you think of it like that. But if you've ever had like an Easter egg, I know when I was a kid, it was like, that was your main chocolate harvesting moment, wasn't it? Like suddenly you've got chocolate at a level that you probably can't even eat it all in one go. So you can think about a strategy and maybe you hide some away or do you, how do you, you have chocolate longer than your sister? This kind of thought. Like, could you reveal an Easter egg in May and be like triumphant, still got chocolate left? And I remember my sister like whipped one out, like, oh, she's got chocolate left. I opened this chocolate up like August or something. But it had gone mouldy and it was like triumphant. The chocolate's gone mouldy. Ah, rue the day. But it's not, it hasn't gone mouldy. What it's done is it, the, it's fat bloomed. So the fats, it's ever so slightly softened. The ingredients inside had rearranged themselves and the fats had risen to the top and formed this sort of bloom. So this is purposely fat bloomed chocolate that is entirely edible. And in some respects is exactly the same stuff before but it isn't it's it's a completely different material by all measures it's different because it doesn't behave the same in your hand it doesn't taste the same it doesn't look the same it is the same ingredients they're just organized differently so it's back to this like what really is a material because if it's like the chemistry of it is sort of the same but the structure of it is entirely different so now it's a new material and it's within the materials library like if something gets broken the two halves of it get two new numbers because it's not the same thing as it was before and they're now new things on a new journey and the things so it's I'm just trying to get you to believe me when I say it's different stuff I suppose um right now we'll just segue into getting up to things because I think the um I've spoken a little bit about what the materials are getting up to and I hope that you'll go away from today and maybe attend tomorrow if you're able appreciating some of what stuff gets up to and with that statement i said at the beginning about materials getting up to things that yeah matter gets up to stuff all the time to generate this world of materials and objects but actually I, this came to me on the train on the way here that i remembered the moment that i when i applied to come here it was to do um film and television because that was what there was and then you turn up in the first week and there's like lectures of other things and you have to do some theater modules and you have to do this stuff and then people uh, there we had a lecture and the idea was like you know the professor of restoration theater gives you a little snippet of that and then you'd sign up for that module or whatever and um maybe go join honors with theater or whatever but anyway we had a lecture and um it mike pearson stood up and just said Men, when left to their own devices, do this, hit play. And he played the most extraordinary film. And I was like, I've come here to do film, thinking I'm going to be kick-ass film director. This is the most extraordinary film I've seen. This is brilliant. And then it was like, women, when left to their own devices, do this, boom, other stuff happens. I'm like, I get this. This is, this is, this is, this is what I want to be doing. And the whole, yeah, so this was introduction to performance studies where it wasn't even a full course we can do a joint honors thing by the end of the day i was signed up for joint honors and i think it's something in like trusting especially when you're young it's easy to do because you haven't got other things to just that sounds better do it do you know what i mean like just just do those things because what mike was saying is this is people getting up to stuff and i was like yeah i can get up to stuff that's what i want to do and i get up to things mm, yes and so like that's what I've been doing is getting up to stuff. So the last thing I want to mention is the most recent thing I'm sort of getting up to. And I, I want to talk about it because it's entirely unresolved. I don't know why I'm getting up to it, but I'm just trusting something's going to happen because I find it's interested me and that's enough. Now I'm going to talk about it in front of people and realize it's an absolute dead end and embarrassment to myself. So uh, during lockdown, how was lockdown for everyone? but um, hope everyone's all right. I unfortunately had a really good time. Um, <laughs> sorry, but, and and I, <laughs> I, I had a really great time because it was like crime getting up to stuff opportunity. You left to your own devices. Like lots of the responsibilities of things 
you could kind of get out of now in a very like, oh, you know, anyway, so there's a chance to get up to stuff. And I would do a lot of walking in central London where I live. And I started noticing this. What is this? A bit of rope on the pavement. No, not on the pavement. In the pavement. In the pavement. What's that? It's not in the pavement. Put it, it's, un, it's coming from under the pavement. What's this? I don't know. And then so take a photo of that. Take a photo of that. I think I put on Twitter like, what's anyone know what this is sort of thing? Because I started to find a lot of them. This is the tip of an iceberg. So two years later, I now have over 400 photos of these bits of rope. But this is, this is very, there are rules here, right? This is not any old bit of polypropylene blue rope. This is polypropylene blue rope that is attached to the underworld. This is what I call Hades polypropylene, okay? <laughs> so Hades polypropylene is in fact rope that is attached into underground and it, what it really is doing is going up pipes and it's used for the pulling of cables. So in noticing this, I've like met the people laying these cables, been in their van, and they show me their special stick for shoving it up the cables. And like, this has become a really rather big and embarrassing documentary project about something that no one else cares about but me. But there's something here that's kind of nice because it's this material is very noticeable, but no one notices it. It's there. There's plenty of it cut around and littering the landscape. No, it doesn't count. It's got to be attached. And it's got to be poking out somewhere somehow. So anyway, there's this. But now I have the burden of every time I bloody well see one, I have to take a photo of it. And I, I can't live my life like that. So, so they come up. There's rural ones as well. This is, there's one right outside my parents' house. Like, then there's also like there's one on my walk every day. So I have to take a photo of that one every day. So I've got a kind of like weather map degradation thing, potential gift that I can make of this, like time lapse of it going from perfect blue rope the moment it was laid to now it's like a frayed brown, do you know what I mean? It's not actually brown, but you know, like in once there was a, so there's, there's, this is a problem. And um, so what do I do? My thinking is, this is where I am right now, is I'm thinking, can you see this? This is like a small, piece of aluminium that's been stamped um, with a number code that I don't know maybe it's the number of the lamppost or something it means something to the to the actually to the electricity board because this is not this is this was here before and normally they're higher up and you see these things around so my thinking is I'm going to have to make some little plaques and I'm going to have to do some uh, pruning of this rope and I'm going to do a I'm going to prune the rope flush and then I'm going to put the plaque on it with the date. Then I'm going to like date stamp that pruning intervention. And then that's like done. That one's done because I've pruned it. And I've put the plaque on it. I don't have to photograph that one anymore. And um, then there'll be these plaques. And then I'm thinking, well, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, yeah, because the other thing is I've learned this is bad practice. So it's not, I'm not going to be in trouble. This is actually, this is very bad practice. I've learned from talking to the people who are involved in these ropes, maybe not so much this one, but like this, this should not be like this. They should cut it off under the paving slab and tie it off. And so I haven't put all the photos of works in progress ones, but like there's plenty where I've come along and chatted to the people doing it and they'll explain, you just tie it around here and then you put the thing on. There's absolutely zero need to leave it dangling out. So I don't feel like I'm like damaging some sort of infrastructure thing that now forevermore won't work because some absolute idiots cut these ropes and they shouldn't be cut like it's okay to cut them that's good to know too uh, but yeah I'll prune I'm going to sort of just urban pruning I've even gone to the point of bought some very special secateurs from Japan to do it with you know what I mean like like extremely sharp because I tried some secateurs and they weren't they didn't I want one fail swoop you know what I mean I don't want to be hacking at these things they need to be the best prune and slice you can do and then do I burn the edge with a little blowtorch and like seal the rope or not? I'm not sure about that yet. Anyway, that's where I am with this. So any thoughts on it would be very much appreciated. Hades polypropylene. Um, any questions about anything are also very welcome. Thank you. What's about the chocolate? Has anyone got chocolate on their hands? Oh, wow. Oh, I feel very pleased with myself for that. Brilliant. Nice. But yeah, different stuff. Any questions? People need to go. I appreciate that. So do go. Don't feel obliged to stay. Brilliant. Thanks so much. We
we have a mic so that those at home can listen. So if there are any questions, don't be afraid of the mic. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just start packing up. <laughs> it takes a while. There we go. Chocolate away. Yeah, thanks for your story. That was very kind. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, is, what is the point of support? I mean, you've got to act if you identify as that. Mm. Because that's about sort of going to the community to help you with your exclusion and that sort of thing. But isn't it really the yeah, I mean, the, the, actually, it's almost, it's quite interesting because pink, it's, to some people, isn't really a colour as well. So it's it's entirely synthetic in that it's, there's not a pink wavelength of light. It is a true combination of, yeah, the mixture of red, enough red light and enough white light and a little bit of blue light. But you're, you're making a mixture that is a human perceived, like, pink. You don't sort of although we can see pink in like flowers and stuff, but it's not, um, what I'm trying to say is, I think we'd all agree though, like it is subjective, but if I showed you two things and said, which is pinker, you sort of do know, because there's something, like that t-shirt is definitely pinker than the cardigan, cardigan three rows back in one way, but they're different, they are different. I, I mean, it's not my project, so I don't need to defend it, but I think there is something where you'd be like, yeah, that is very pink, and there's no hint of something else going on there. Like it's not like a tiny gone into purple, and it's not like a tiny bit slipped over with too much white that's made it like dusty, or it's like the essence of pink. That's what the and the paint is very very pink. It's almost neon, but it's not neon, so you can't go oh it's just neon pink. But no, it's not neon either. So yeah, it's it's clever. It was also done with the express notion of making it open source. So part of the project was to say, it's open source pink rather than pink, uh, black pigment that only these artists, this artist can use. It was like a statement against art that will do an open source color then. Can't own color kind of. Unless it's used by me. Or Vanta Black in your Mish Kapoor, yeah. It's okay to just want to come up and touch the things. You can do that. I, I've got a, a quick question, I guess, about, um, so you're talking about materials that help us in conceptualizing things. Um, like, at the moment, what are the sort of materials that are kind of really twisting your concept of what mm. a material can do? Like, mm -hmm. what, when you go, actually, it's that kind of, that advancement in that particular area of material science that's really affecting the way we might be able to think about things profoundly. Um, I mean, there are, there are things called like metamaterials that are, I find very difficult to understand. So I think that falls into that category. It's like I don't really understand. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I can't really explain it. And there's also there's a type of material. So a metamaterial would that's described as invisible, but you can see it. But it is also invisible if you look at it in the right way. And you're like, I need to understand. But what we really mean is if you look at it. So with light, I the bit of the electromagnetic spectrum you can see that is if a prism hits it and then split into colors, that bit of the electromagnetic spectrum we call visible light, but there are other bits of that spectrum that in some ways are still light, but that we don't see. So infrared and ultraviolet, but you can do something to make them visible. So if you had a ultraviolet, I'm oh, sorry, a fluorescent or a neon material, what that's doing is it's absorbing that part of the spectrum we don't see. So that energy wave it absorbs it. And this absorbs some colors and doesn't absorb greenness, but this absorbs all of that. And then it gets it energized and it, ex it excites it. And the uh, electrons jump in it because they've been excited by this energy. And that you then see the resultant energy that they give off in that jumping as, oh, it's glowed neon pink or it's it's you know like glow in the dark it's like it's not there then it's yellow that's what's happening is that the invisible light so these meta like this invisible material that's visible is invisible to those wavelengths of light that are also invisible but if you look at it through an infrared camera you can't it's not there if you look at it with your eyes it's there 
Anyway. Got it. Yeah, no. But it's like, <laughs> where do we get some of this? Their, their non thereness and their to whom. Who, why? Who's developing them and why? Like, what, what's. The... Well, so for example, Sorry. a lot of this stuff is a bit military, which okay. you can imagine, yeah. because they're like, well, if we've got, I don't know, a tank seems so old school, but maybe not anymore, but like a tank. And we, we used to put it under like a net that looked like the bushes or something. Um, that works quite well. But if you then fly over with a drone using an infrared camera, i.e. a heat seeking camera, you'll see, oh, landscape, landscape, cold bit of metal or landscape, landscape, hot body, because it's using infrared to look at things. So it doesn't, they could do it at night. It doesn't matter. Camouflage of the eye doesn't matter anymore, but camouflage to the infrared eye matters so you then can take this material and throw a net of it over the top and then it is invisible to that thing as well so that that is one use Brilliant. that i would I do <laughs> yeah military uses yeah so that's another mm. whole topic of conversation mm -hmm. military advances um I, there's still questions if people would like to, to jump in we've got a question uh, just a, a Question and a comment online from Miranda Wall. She says, I remember last time you came to talk 10 years or so ago, you showed us a material that grew in the body to mimic bone. This material must have advanced. And so do you feel obliged yeah. to archive the advancement? Um, so I've got a bit of the original and a bit of the newer stuff. For those who don't know about it, it's a, a type of glass that's implanted into the body. And when it's in you, your body registers its presence as a provocation to grow new bone and it grows it's a scaffolding and it's a food so it grows into it and onto it and it digests it as it grows so in the period of time you don't have bone anymore you I mean you don't have an implant anymore you just have the bone back so this used to be able to do chunks like that now they've got much larger chunks and now they've also developed like a paste version yeah that's it a paste version that can be used to like like a polyfiller and it's being used in dentistry so i do have some of the paste it's like a syringe paste but i don't feel obliged to i think i'm very happy that if i didn't get a bit just to know about what's happening with it is fine yeah you can't pick it up it's really heavy i've turned the magnet on underneath no, I haven't. um yeah I, I don't think i feel obliged like i'm happy for it to be its own moment but it's sort of interesting to touch in with where it goes next but it's like the second installment of a film you enjoy, like part two, I don't know. I mean, Crocodile Dundee 2 is as good as one, so that's not a good example. But, um, the, the, you know, the, the sequel isn't like, it is, isn't it? But the sequel of a film isn't, is often not as good as the real thing. And in some ways, like, it's like the, it, the original thing is brilliant and then the next is increments and it's just like, it's better, but it's not, Entirely dazzling again. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can't grow a whole leg back with it because it's the the amount that will grow and be structurally stable isn't very big. You can do work on like wrists and hands and teeth and facial, but like, which is still really life changing, you know, for you to be able to re facial reconstructive surgery and things like that. But it's not like weight bearing. But there is work. Um, we've got a project in fact looking at, because there's prosthetics, which is you don't have a limb anymore. But then there's orthotics, which is you have a limb, it just doesn't function in the way you might like. And actually, that's an interesting area because. There's a thing still there, it's just not working. What can you do? And in fact, um, it was actually part of a TV show I was doing, but then it, so I, I made it for telly as like, they were, doc, it was a documentary, but then it became a research project afterwards as well. But I made, there was a guy I was working with who was paralyzed. So he couldn't move his fingers, but he could move his arms, but he couldn't, he didn't have any dexterity. So I made for him uh, his gloves, that had cables inside that attached to a motor that was voice activated. That I had to have help with, but the idea and the reality was you could go left pinch 
and the cables, appropriate cables would go and it would go and move his fingers. So it was, his hands were like a marionette in that respect and you could have control. So he was able to hold a pen and cut, use a knife and, but he was able to squeeze his partner's hand. And that was like, the moment was like, wow. And then we did a project which was all about aesthetics and prosthetics and the materials that they're made of that aren't about high performance function, you know, super limb that you can go faster than any humans ever gone before. It's like, actually what would be a hand that you would love to hold your loved one's hand with? Like what, what are those materials that are kind of intimate? Um, but that's one, one project. But the, back to the limb bit that actually there's, we'd also have been working on a project to look at essentially really sophisticated calipers that put material on the outside that's, that's 3D printed to the point that we're designing new structures. So it goes back inside the material and you design a structure that generates a behavior that's entirely bespoke. So a piece of fabric floppy around, but if you can build that fabric from the inside out, you can tell that fabric to be floppy in that direction and entirely rigid once it gets to there because you design the structure inside it so that it stops when it gets to there. So then you can have a pair of leggings that are flexible to walk, but don't ever go like my hand goes, do you see what I mean? Don't allow a knee to go beyond a certain point or on a certain rotation. And that actually you can then put something on that you can then have a stability, like what might've been some caliper contraption to help someone walk or they wouldn't have tried. Like it's then a, a piece of clothing they could wear under other clothes and just be able to move their limbs in a new way. Um, I'm tangential, but that's is a project, one of, you know, at the Institute of Making. Um, a little bit, but not, yeah, we're at UCL, so they, we have our own hospital. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but yes, I mean, we, I have, I have done stuff with them. Oh, yeah. Well, it is a glass of water, but I was thinking I might put this in it because I've had this knocking around the bottom of my bag for like, I don't know, a long time. Let's see if it still does it. So it might take up all the water. Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a sponge. It's not very exciting. But the, the point is that um, in industry, if you order sponges, they come like that because they don't want to package and transport air. <laughs> so we know sponges as consumers who buy them inflated. Do you know what I mean? And I just thought it's nice to know. It might, it might do that whole glass. It's, not, it's still dry up there. But yeah, so it's, it's a normal sponge. Um, let's get that last bit, but it's just in its sort of transportable mode. Um, there we go. Let's let that be there. We're going past six thirty, which is oh, do we finish time? But you know, these things are loose. Who is coming tomorrow? Us. Okay. Yeah. Um, we we have one question on online, but but Phil I know is coming tomorrow, so I think that question, Phil, if you can. Um, oh, he, he's one more. Let's go one more. One okay. More. Um, so uh, Paul says, "Hi Andrew, I wonder if Zoe has any more thoughts on the challenges of defining terms and possible differences between materials, objects, things, and stuff." Yeah, yeah. And I think that relates directly to Paul's PhD. Is it's okay, I'll cool. send him some useful stuff on that so that he can use that if he wants. Um, say it again. Oh, useful okay. stuff. Any, any, any more thoughts? Yeah. Defining terms and possible differences between materials, objects, things, yeah. and stuff. I would say you just stake out your territory and go with it. Don't worry about that too much. Like, just get on with it. So, 
I've decided this is what I think about that. And I can send him the writing if he wants that position. But the point is, I would say, there's no such thing as materials. There's no such thing as objects. There's only materials, objects, and they're always in negotiation. So when I say spoon, you have in your mind's eye an idea of a spoon. And then when you see things in the world, you might be going, you're mapping that doo -doo -doo -doo, against all other things you've seen that someone's told you was called a spoon. And then you'd be like, it's a spoon, job done. But you come across things and you think it's a bit not like some other spoons I've seen. And then you start to notice the material and you start to go, oh, it's a copper spoon or something like that becomes important. And then you can start to change the material so that you, so there's a sort of material form function triangle that you can dance around in. And if you're altering the material, you do, you will be altering the function, but you might keep the shape the same. So I could make this exact spoon out of chocolate and it will look 100% spoon, but it will function 10% spoon. So is it still a spoon? Like where, when do we, when do we say that it's a spoon? And it, one game of that is we agree it's a spoon when it has the shape, we all know a spoon. But if the shape is consistent, but the material is so not spoon, that it's not like a chair you can't sit on because it's not made of something that's sittable. Is it really a chair? Like, so it's always, they're all materials objects because they're always negotiation of that shape and the stuff of the shape that the shape's made into. So stuff and things are like interchangeable. Anyway, that might be helpful. It might make it worse. That, that is about the negotiation. It's about the negotiation. It's a negotiation. That's what I think. Negotiations and processes have really come to the fore today as opposed to... Yeah. The stability of a, a thing or an object or a material yeah. in some form. Well, this is very good. A little staging going on here under the roof. Fantastic. Um, I think let, we might we might finish up there. And just, um, if you could join me in thanking Zoe for this fantastic talk demonstration and, and ramble. ramble as well. <laughs>